I'm sure there are going to be people, and I'm sure you've received this before, who mm. say she calls herself a black woman, but mm. she has pale skin. Yeah. Like, is yeah, she yeah. really a black woman? So, okay, I want to make sure I know how to properly pronounce your name. I appreciate that. It's Tando. 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 Yes. Okay. Tando. Hopa. Tando. Hopa. Yes. Very close. Thank you. Because a lot of the times I get Tando, which is not the right one. <laughs> Gallop, it sounds like he's coming to see us. You're afraid of dogs. So could you grab Gallop? Oh, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Gallop knows. He's like, she's afraid of me. I'm going to go say hi. Make and I'm going to sit right beside her. <laughs> oh, that's that's really sweet. I'm so sorry. I just... I know. A lot of people have a fear. Especially he looks so big and intimidating. Yeah, he does. And he's like the sweetest little soul. And it's actually the second time he, uh, he comes to me. Because the other time he just came and he was just like spreading. I was like... <laughs> okay, okay. Now we, we know each other. We're, 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 we're fine now. But he's, he's, he's quite kind. Yeah. He is. He's a it's sweet just, guy. Me being afraid of dogs, it, that's my stuff. You know? I understand. So, my biggest fear is birds. Like I'm just absolutely terrified of birds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I get it. It's like... You know mentally it's fine, but you still have that like... Mm -hmm. So do you currently live in South Africa? Yes, I'm based in South Africa, Johannesburg. So it's quite a cosmopolitan city and I always say that the first time I actually traveled the world was in Johannesburg because I had all of these people from all over the world, you know, from Zimbabwe, which is a country in Africa, to, you know, the United States, to Russia, to... You almost, you know, to people in Ethiopia, you, you had so yeah. much diversity in Johannesburg. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so it's, I think it's, it's, it's home, so it's my core. As much as I travel, and I love the snow, but I, I miss the summer yes. <laughs> that I left back home. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm from Toronto originally, and it's uh -huh. very multicultural. It's the most multicultural city in North America. Mm -hmm. So I feel the same, like I was raised around authentic ethnic foods and diverse people. And, you know, I, I really appreciated growing up in an environment like that. I think it's really important to surround yourself with diversity, especially when you don't fit in in your own mold, you know? you So, growing up as a blind woman, I appreciated at least having diverse cultures and experiences and gender identities and sexualities around me because it made me, even though I wasn't necessarily surrounded by other disabled people, it made me feel like I wasn't so much the odd man out, if that makes sense. I would describe you as an intellectual. Mm, thank you. No, well, you are. You are. I'm just wondering, who are your mental mentors? I love learning about experiences that I don't understand. Mm. I love watching documentaries about drug addiction and recovery. Mm. It's, it's not something that affects me or anyone in my life, mm. but I find it interesting to understand people. Mm. I like consuming content about feminism, about mm. the trans community, about... I like to learn about other experiences because I found so much growing up that people didn't care to learn about mine. Mm. And it frustrated me. And when I started to learn about other minority groups, about people in taboo industries, about people who have, you know, gone to jail or got, you know work in the sex trade whatever it might be when I take the time to learn about their experiences what the, what they've lived through what led up to where they are I feel like so much more connection to the world you know it's like you see that these people who you once thought might have been so different from you you actually have so many shared lived experiences with and so I think that's where I, I get it is just consuming documentaries reading books and I, I really like being able to take experiencing experiences and bridging the gap for other people so trying to take something that might be hard to digest or difficult to understand and finding a way to make it relatable to their life so you know for me I see these weird flashing lights and so I connect it to sighted people by saying it's like fireworks mm. it's like I see fireworks all the time mm. so it's like a way that they can understand mm. what is something they will never live okay I 
That's deep. <laughs> That's deep. So you, but you're, I mean, you I are interviewing you. me. You're like, I was going to say, you're interviewing me, but I have so many things that I, I want to share about your story because I think like you were listening to me, you felt a connection to the words I was saying, and I felt the same listening to your presentation. And when I was looking at the other people who were going to be here, you were the one of the ones I was most interested in because you're a model, but you're a lawyer. You're a black woman but you have albinism it, it's it's you've lived a fascinating experience you have very diverse experiences and I, I want to share that with my audience because I think so many of them will connect with you as well okay so interestingly with albinism and I explained it in my presentation is that because I have a lack of pigmentation in my body including my eyes it creates a myopia and a great deal of people with albinism not all considered legally Yes, I have many, many friends. Yes, yes. <laughs> so things like driving are not necessarily accessible to us. But there are people with albinism who can drive, so it's not a, a standardization. Okay, I became a model, which was quite strange because, you know, having a legal background, I never anticipated ever that I would be modeling. But I did it because there was no representation. No, no, that's not correct. There was hardly any yes. representation, you know? And and when I went into it, I didn't understand how many facets of representation I would be negotiating. From albinism to race, to gender, to being African, you know. So I was constantly having these battles in my mind. But then at the same time, I also learned how to redirect those battles. Because as much as there were challenges, but they also gave me so many access points to humanity, you know. Because through gender, we had a shared story. Through race, there was a shared story. Through nation, there was a shared story. Through albinism, there was a shared story. Through law, there was a shared story. Through multiple professions, there was a shared story, you know. So I actually allowed myself to use those multiple identities to kind of access broader humanity and relatability and shared experiences. It's so interesting because I'm very passionate about representation as well, as you know. And something I battle with, and I wonder if you've ever struggled with this, is tokenism. Am I being used as a marketing ploy for brownie points? Or is, it, is, this, is this company or brand authentically wanting to represent diversity? Have you ever struggled with that? A plenty. <laughs> but I think more than anything, I make it less about what the company's objectives are and I make it more about what my objectives are. Yes. So I ask myself, is the representation inclusive? Is the narrative progressive? Does it enhance diversity? And is it sustainable? So is it sustainable in terms of narrative, but is it also sustainable for me in terms of business? And then when I look at all of those things and I think, okay, companies will like... 98% of the time have self-interest to deal with. Yes. So already I just I already know what I'm dealing with. But the question is when I participate with this company, would it be for the greater good according to me? Mm. So it had to fulfill my objectives. But also is that you know, a great deal of the time if you have diversity without inclusion, tokenism is the result. And it becomes yes. so clear. Yes. You know, because then you want the symbolic representation. Sure, we have, you know, one brown girl and one black girl and <laughs> one Asian, you know? They have the checklist. Exactly, like one, yeah. one. Mm -hmm. And then now you, you, you've created this lovely window dressing, you know? But something is going to come out that shows that you are being not inclusive, you know? And how the story is told. And, and, and oh, geez, there's, so many, there's so many things that actually expose tokenism. Because when you see, like, big brands being called out on certain things mm -hmm. it's because they didn't look at inclusion as sort of a multifaceted approach they thought we're being diverse therefore we're being inclusive right. but if they had looked at behind the scenes is there representation you know is there inclusion and when I, when, I, when I say to people you know when you're looking at diversity and inclusion and particularly inclusion you have to look at it in a multifaceted way right down to how are you drafting your contracts are you drafting your contracts in a way that enhances a restriction of agency where you take away representation or control over representation because a great deal of the time people want you to rubber stamp representation they want you to rubber stamp whatever they perceive you to be 
So you have no voice over what you want in terms of that representation. And that's why I even said in my presentation that equal control over representation is important. Because if you're just there to just be like, oh, this is what we think a person of albinism is, and this is what we think the story is, just rubber stamp it. You just need to come and be part of the story, their story. And it, that's going to come out. It's going to come out in the content. People will see it. They'll see that this is not... They'll see it, through it. It's inauthentic, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. And they'll be able to see that there was a li limitation in agency. So because I like to celebrate when when brands do the right thing, yes, yes, I want to yes. know what is your favorite campaign you've worked on as a model? What's your favorite brand you've worked with as a model? <laughs> My favorite, 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 Pirelli. It was Pirelli. And the reason I really loved Pirelli is because it gave me insight on what inclusive representation would be. From the time I got on set, I was asked what I want to do with my hair. You know, they had, because they had seen my pictures before, they already had natural hair products as options. Right? I was asked what I want to do with my brows so nobody just came and started darkening my brows or, because there's, there's something about that that just says I'm fixing you. Yeah, I'm changing you know, you I'm to just, fit exactly, what I want you to Exactly, fit. exactly. So I'm just going to do this because there's something that's missing and I'm going to impose myself on you. And then there, was, there wasn't that. They, they, what would you like to do with your brows? You know, and I'm like, no, I'd like to leave them, I'd like to leave them pale. And they're like, okay, that's fine. Even with oh. dress. Yes. Oh. I remember they put me on this wonderful um, yellow dress and it was open at the back. And they said to me, are you okay with it being open at the back? And I said, yes. You know, I'm like, I didn't even notice it was open at the back, but I, I appreciated that they asked. Because you're dealing with three things there. Hair, you're dealing with race. Eyebrows, you're dealing with albinism. Clothes, you're dealing with gender. Yeah. So in that, in that, in these little spaces with these little actions, they unburdened me of feeling like I need to defend a particular part of me because they allowed for consultation, you know? Mm. And that, that, that was such an important thing when you're looking at inclusion. I didn't have to feel like I have to be like, no, you know, I, I don't feel comfortable with this. They asked first, do you feel comfortable with this? I didn't have to say. You it. didn't have to put yourself out okay, there you know? and feel vulnerable exactly. and say, I'm uncomfortable. Exactly. We sat down with the photographer and we talked about the story so much that it became both our stories, you know? What we did, with Alice in Wonderland and representation. His story was mine and my story was his. Mm -hmm. And by the time we actually had the final product, everything about that, into, to a point where I actually wrote for the calendar, it brought in my voice through many facets. Not just the modeling photo, which was beautiful, but I wrote for the calendar and I wrote for the newspaper for the calendar. That's how much the message just broadened. How they cared. You they, know, yeah. exactly. And for me, that was a wonderful, pro it was one of my favorite projects. Because I was actually just signed up first as a model. But it grew, grew from it there. grew that way, yeah. So we've moved spaces. Mm -hmm. We yes. found a nice little quiet, well-lit studio. If only we had begun here, this is great. So I know that there's going to be many people in the world who have never met somebody with albinism. Mm. I'm somebody who, because I was raised around other blind and visually impaired people, mm. I had many friends who have it. So. Mm. What, for those who have never met somebody with albinism, would you like them to know? Okay. First of all, albinism have, like it manifests in all races. A great deal of the time, people usually assume that it's a black thing. It's not a black thing. It happens in all races. And also is that basically it's a combination of recessive genes. And those recessive genes make you lack pigmentation. You have it in varying degrees, but you don't have a lot of it. But it's, it's there are people who, I suppose, you could argue have no pigmentation. But then that becomes when, uh, when you're ordinarily expected person to have a brown body, they would have a pale body uh, and still be Indian or African or whatever the case may be. So that's, it's a genetic occurrence that, yeah, I don't know how else to explain it. It just manifests in all races. And, and I think that's important because I'm, I'm sure there are going to be people, and I'm sure you've received this before, who mm. say she calls herself a black woman. But she has pale skin. Yeah, like, is yeah, she really yeah. a black woman? Does yeah, she, you yeah, know? yeah. What I would guess. you say to people who say things like that? It's that, you know, one thing I learned about race through this body is that it's an institution. It's an institution that has very real consequences. It's an institution that's about 500 years old, 400 years old, 300 years old, depending where you are in the world. And as much as 
people wanted the institution to only be subscribed as a color-based institution. But it's actually, it's an institution that from three or four hundred years ago, I have the consequences and I carry the consequences of. Whether you call me black or not, I carry the consequences of blackness. And that's why I call it an institution. It's not just a color thing. But racial discrimination is a color thing. So yes. as much as brown people experience racial discrimination because of color, I experience racial discrimination because of color, even if albinism is not a race. I love that you put it that way. Mm. Do any of your siblings have albinism? Yes, actually. My brother has albinism. Uh, two of my sisters are brownies. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I think, important for him to have somebody who was older than him who has gone through the experience. Because for me, as I explained, I mean, I looked different from my parents, my sisters, everybody in my school, you know. Right. And, and I almost had a reverse relationship with concepts like beauty, confidence, enoughness. Because, you know, when you're five, I was, when people explained me, they were like, she was this child who was loud and what, and she was a tomboy. And then as I grew older, I became more restricted. Because when I went out of the world from home, which was my sanctum, and I was perfect, and I was beautiful, and I was everything, you know, it was like... And then I, I went out where the perception I had of myself was continuously attacked. And now when I grew older, I almost had to regain that sense of enoughness, of beauty, which I'm constantly sort of readjusting and reaffirming. It's, 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 a continuous journey but I had a reverse relationship with beauty and confidence because I had it lost it then had to regain it find it yeah, yeah. So, so how did you go about that journey of refinding confidence hmm. I think it was and is still a journey there wasn't a point in time where there was this you know, okay, now I'm fine. Everything is okay. Now I'm a model. You know, and I'm no, exactly, in the exactly. industry where I'm told I'm beautiful. Exactly. And, yeah. No. It was constantly learning myself. I mean, I remember my, I once went to my dad and I said to him, I was about 12 years old and I cried and I said, I don't want to look this way anymore. I don't want, I don't want to be this anymore. You know? And he said, why? Why? And I said, I'm not attractive. Why? Why? Why am I born like this? And my father says to me, and I'll never forget it. And he said, and he called me by my clan name, which is Mamwevu. And Mamwevu means mother of gray hairs, because that's just our, our clan, we get gray hairs early, like around 20s, we get gray hairs. But anyway, he calls me by my clan name, and he says, Mamwevu, almost as though he was trying to just bring me back down, back to down, earth. and like ground yourself, yes. you know. And he says, I have never seen such a beautiful girl in my life. You're the most beautiful girl I've ever seen. And I was just like, you're say that because you're my yeah, father. You have to <laughs> say that. But you know, that moment did something, it planted something. So it wasn't like I went back to school and now I'm beautiful, and, but it planted something. And as time went on, I learned how to grow that seed. It was, and I think modeling, strangely, because it's, it's, it's such an image-based profession where your confidence is usually targeted. It actually helped me find my enoughness. And it helped me find my enoughness by me releasing myself from the need of validation. Because when I decided I'm going to show my eyebrows and eyelashes as pale, it wasn't something I had seen. You know, I hadn't seen a black woman with albinism show her eyebrows and eyelashes as pale, and I was scared. I actually, I felt like people would reject the way I looked, but I still took the leap. I did it afraid in the modeling space. And this is how I actually, it's, it's strange that it was this space that made me ask myself questions about representation, ask myself questions about how I looked. And it was this space where I put myself out there and I, it's not like I got positive feedback from the get-go, you know? Yeah. When I started like, okay, okay, I'm going to show, I'm going to show myself as I am. Woo! <laughs> Listen, don't read the comment section. Mm. Like, that comment section was brutal. I had it. She looks like a monkey. Blah, blah, blah. I know, it got hectic. It got so hectic. And I remember there was a time when I got back home and I just cried. But I, 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 I think this was an initiation process where I, I had to learn enoughness. 
I had to choose to learn enoughness to be like I am beautiful enough I am smart enough I am capable enough you know I had to almost use that as a mantra to consistently build my emotional resilience because I was trying to represent something that was so underrepresented and it would have been easier for me to darken my brows and eyelashes and this is not this is not me making any issue about a beauty choice it's not about a beauty choice for me it was an issue of representation and it was an issue of me feeling like with these things that I'm adding onto my body do I do them for validation or do I do them for expression for instance and I was doing them for validation and I had to release myself from that and I had to use such a public platform to do that experiment. <laughs> for most of my teenage years, I had my brows and eyelashes pale. And that because you know when you go into school, now South African schools, I don't know I don't know how North America works, but we wear school uniform and uh, you know No makeup no makeup, no makeup you know, yeah. Yeah. so I kind of was forced to, you know, look that way. And it was a time when I felt most unattractive. So one day I darkened my eyebrows, I actually went for a dye. So I left home looking this way and then I came back home looking very different. My mother was like, ha! Huh? You know, like, what? So I, I, I darkened my brows, I darkened my lashes. And I remember I was going to a friend's party. And when I got there, everybody said, wow, you look so beautiful. So it reaffirmed Friends. that that's the way I was it's like, and look. then I was like, I got it. I finally got it. I got that, you know, like that magic wand that made me get this beautiful word for my peers. Sure, I had it from my parents, but I was, I was like, no, you guys are supposed to say that. You're supposed to say I'm beautiful. My peers were not giving me that. So when I finally did that, I when got you that. changed yourself when, exactly to fit the, exactly. the norm. When I assimilated, really, you know, I was like, wow, you know. And I had to almost now in the modeling space because when I even went into the modeling space, I, I was doing the same thing, darkening, darkening, you know. And then one day I had to ask myself, I'm like, if I said I want to represent albinism in a positive way, why would I be afraid to show it? with its beautiful, unique characteristics. It's pale eyebrows, pale eyelashes, and this is not a no makeup look. Some people are like, no, this is a no makeup. No, it's not a no makeup look. I still put on makeup. <laughs> it's to embrace the uniqueness of the biological characteristics. And by the way, if you want to darken your eyebrow, like, there's nothing wrong. This is my stuff. It's my, like, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, this is not, it's not a judgment of a beauty choice. Yeah, you know? so, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, over the last, I'd say, year and a half to two years in the beauty industry, mm. there's been a large conversation around expanding shade ranges. Mm. And that has mainly been expanding shade range to darker skin tones. Mm, 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 mm. And this is me with a spray tan. Like yes, I'm yes. very fair skinned. Mm, mm, and mm, so mm. I was very excited to see this expansion of shade ranges, mm. but they didn't expand down. And I would often think of my friends with albinism. I carried my own makeup. I carry my own uh, foundation because a great deal of the time, I mean, I'm in a country where you have a lot of brown people. And then usually what they would do is they would use a um, color that they would ordinarily use for most Caucasian people. And not all Caucasian people are a particular color range. There are those who are pale. But I'm usually, even if you look at ourselves now, see if you look at that, I'm actually, um, I'm lighter than you. I'm lighter than most Caucasian people. So I really struggled with foundation, yeah. you know? So I, as a black woman, struggle with foundation tick but not the same way other black women struggle with foundation yes <laughs> so it's actually it's quite a so very... you still understand the struggle exactly in a but different it's way. so it's so different so while they're developing color ranges as you said moving browner and browner and browner as a black woman i'm not catered for because i'm not seen in the same the dominant understanding of black I don't fit into that right. dominant understanding. So is there brands that cater to women with albinism in terms of foundation shades and oh, concealers? Wow. They would have to pay me to tell you. Oh! <laughs> She's got the secret! One of them is actually approaching me, so I'm not going to say Okay. I don't even think they know that they're actually... We'll, we'll chat off camera about that. Audience. I'll get the secrets. <laughs> I love how you interview. You know, I've, I've gone through so many interviews and you're young but you have a way of interviewing that makes me relate so much to you and oh. i appreciate it because i just 
I just relax. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. Like I said earlier, I love learning about people. Mm. You know, and I, I like mm. being able to share that mm. with mm. my audience. Mm. And so if they do want to stay in touch with you, follow your journey more, learn more about okay. you, where can they find you? Instagram is Tando Hopa. And for Twitter, it's at Tando underscore Hopa. And on Facebook, it's just Tando Hopa. All the links will be down below. I want to give you a hug. Oh, I'm just so glad oh, I got to meet you. I'm oh, so glad we've been likewise, able to connect. Likewise. This has been amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Yay.